Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the host of the conference, Michael Hennessy. Okay. Now, come on, admit it wasn't that that solid. I mean, didn't that take you right to the beaches of Corfu? Um, so, once again, double thanks to our uh, our platinum sponsor, Astral, for the luncheon. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Calandra, Parliamentary Secretary to the Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage, James Moore. Minister Moore was, as I said, unable to be with us here today, but we're very happy to have Paul step in for him. Paul represents the riding of Oak Ridges, Markham, and was first elected to Parliament in 2008. We know he's here to make an announcement, so without further ado, we'll let Paul do that. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. And let me just again uh, reiterate how uh, uh, sorry the minister is that he could uh, he could not be here today. Uh, uh, he wants to send his uh, his greetings and best wishes uh, for a successful uh, conference. I know I also saw uh, another member of Parliament, Pierre Nantel, was I saw him outside. I think he might be here somewhere. Uh, um, so welcome him as well. Uh, I uh, again, I'm bringing greetings on behalf of, of the minister. I'm delighted to be here to be at prime time on behalf of the Honourable James Moore, the Minister of Canadian Heritage, and let me thank CMPA, uh, specifically President Michael Hennessy, Chairman David McLeod, and VP Marks again for the great lineup of panels and speakers. As our government prepares to release a new federal budget, I am pleased to be here among Canada's best and brightest from our film, TV, media, broadcasting, and telecommunications industries. As you know well, in recent years, Canadians watched film and television in record numbers. Canada's film and television production sector grew by over a half billion dollars last year from 2.5 to 3 billion annually in 2011 and 12. That's a 20% increase, which resulted in the creation of more than 66,000 well-paid jobs well-paid jobs across Canada. The volume of Canadian theatrical production rose by 14% last year, which is a 10-year high. Theatrical production is an industry now worth over one-third of a billion dollars to our economy each year. Can yes, absolutely. It's $381 million, which is fantastic. Canadian television production rose over 21% from 2010-2011 to a 10-year high of $2.58 billion. The increase is largely due to English language fiction, where the volume of production was up 23% from 2010-11 to 2011-12. Canadian documentary production increased by 14.6%. It too is an industry worth over one third of a billion dollars to Canada's economy, which is over $369 million in 2011 and 12. Canadian animation production increased by 
in 2011 and 12 to $208 million. Canadians are also some of the most active consumers of digital media in the world today. 96% of Canadian households have access to broadband and typically 54 hours a month are spent on the internet. 54 hours a month, of course, that doesn't include the endless hours that probably all of you, and I know me, uh, spend on our Blackberries, Playbooks, iPhones, iPads, iPods, iPod minis, Androids, Galaxies, Optimus Gs, and, and on and on and on. And hopefully none of you are doing that right now. But uh, whoever is, I know, is feeling really guilty and trying to hide it. But I can't see you because the lights are bright. So uh, more Canadians than ever, more Canadians than ever before are on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, in fact, I was just mentioning a story that I was in the House of Commons just the other day, and uh, the moment I sat down from voting, a constituent emailed me and couldn't believe that it actually voted that way on Twitter. I hadn't even sat back down in my seat, which, which goes to show you just how important these two mediums have become. Uh, according to uh, Facebook, on a percentage basis, more people in Canada use Facebook than in any other country in the world. Social networking is exploding in Canada, and so are the opportunities. I know you all know the stats, that we are, living, uh, we are living this transformation on a daily basis. And because Canadian consumption of digital media is exploding, so too is the desire for this content. That's where you all obviously come in. Thanks to your efforts, our digital media industry is stronger than ever before. These numbers are the results of the efforts of Canadian creativity and the boldness and ingenuity of everyone in this room. It is your job to create high quality, compelling Canadian content. And it is the government's job to create the conditions necessary for you all to thrive. It is clear that you are doing your job. I hope by the end of, uh, of my remarks, some of you will share uh, my direction on the federal government's role in our creative economy. Uh, so before going further, I would like to speak to our government's ongoing commitment to Canadian culture. And first, a little bit of context. Uh, uh, about four and a half years ago, the world economy was in dire straits. We were in the midst of an election when the deepest worldwide recession since the 1930s hit us head on. And I can tell you as a first time candidate in 2008, I remember knocking on someone's door. It's something I'll never forget. Uh, uh, and he came to the door and he, was, he looked terribly frazzled. And uh, I couldn't help but ask him, I said, what, what's wrong? And he said, the Dow Jones is just down 1,500 points and it's only one o'clock. Uh, and uh, he said, as a lot of people say to a candidate when they are at the door, he said, I'm gonna vote for you. I took him at his word, although I know he's probably said that to everybody, but the thing I, I remember is this. He said, I'm gonna vote for you, but don't let me down because we're in trouble. And I've never forgot those words from that person. It was just an extraordinarily critical time. And Canada's response, of course, was our government's economic action plan, which provided Canadians with the support that we needed to protect our economy and protect Canadian jobs. And I just want to thank those of you who helped make those wonderful ads that we see on TV that Canadians love so much. Uh, they are doing a wonderful job of explaining to Canadians how, how much our government is doing. Uh, it was challenging economic times. We decided to make key investments in culture. So put again in context, while other governments in other countries were making decisions to heavily cut, and in some cases eliminate entirely their support for culture, our government chose a different path. The two-year economic action plan didn't cut, it didn't maintain, but rather we increased funding for culture. And contrast this with decisions by other governments around the world. In the United States, the National Endowment for the Arts runs on less money today than it did 20 years ago. After the recession, the Arts Council of England saw its funding cut and its operating costs cut in half. In Canada, we did different. We decided to permanently increase funding for the Canadian Council of the Arts by 20%, the largest funding increase for the Canada Council in decades. After the recession in the United Kingdom, grants to museums were cut by 15%. Meanwhile, we created three new national museums, the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 in Halifax, and the Canadian Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg, and of course, the Canadian Museum of History here in the nation's capital. In Australia, the budget for the Australian Council for the Arts is $163 million. 
The budget for the Canadian Council of the Arts is more than $180 million. And why, why did we do these things? We did this because we understand that supporting culture is absolutely essential to keeping our economy on track. We understand then, as we still do, the importance of the creative economy and of safeguarding Canada's cultural community for econo from economic devastation. That a, a bit more in context, our cultural sector employs 630,000 people, which is to say that 4% of all Canadian, Canadian jobs come from culture. Canada's culture represents $46 billion to our GDP. That's twice, twice as much as, forest, as our forestry industry and three times as much as our country's insurance industry. And that's why we stabilized and locked in our funding for programs that support our creative economy. And while we do these things, we made sure that while funding for the arts organizations across Canada went up, funding to bureaucracy in Ottawa went down. Under Minister Moore, uh, when he became the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Official Languages three years ago, there were about 2,500 bureaucrats working within the department in Ottawa. Now it's down to 1,900, and soon it will be down to 1,700. By 2015, the Department of Canadian Heritage will be 40% smaller than when Minister Moore was appointed. And what does that mean? It means less regulation, less red tape, more support for the new Canadian content and better conditions for Canadian digital media industry to thrive. Last year, our government took steps to modernize Canada's copyright laws. Copyright modernization means that Canadian creators are now well positioned to take full advantage of the opportunities presented by the digital world and the global marketplace. It will boost our ability to compete internationally and stimulate, stimulate economic growth for years to come. This legislation would not be possible if it was not for the support of many of you, of, of you in the room, and I know I met with a large number of you over those many months, and I want to thank the CMPA for its strong, unwavering support for copyright reform. In fact, your president, uh, Noah Boland, said, quote, we applaud the government for bringing forward copyright reform. This bill will bring Canada in line with our competitors and allow our creative industries to flourish. On our copyright legislation, the Canadian Entertainment Software Association of Canada said, we congratulate the government on its copyright legislation. It is good public policy and essential to our economy. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce said, the bill lays the foundation for future economic growth and job creation. And finally, the Business Coalition for Balanced Copyright has said, the government took a common sense, balanced approach to copyright legislation. It's a positive step and achieves balance between interests of consumers and creators. And we also looked, of course, and we also created the Canada Media Fund five years ago with the goal of Canadian viewers, uh, of giving Canadian viewers better access to Canadian content. The Canada Media Fund uh, is, not is not perfect. We know that. Uh, I know many of you have shared your ideas for improving the fund. For starters, you said you wanted the fund being made permanent, permanent and our government listened. Last year, our government invested in, in the CMF $358 million in total, generated over 2,700 hours of new programming, with every dollar generating almost $4 uh, worth of production activity. More importantly, the quality of these productions was recognized. Last year, 109 CMF-funded projects won more than 200 prizes in 26 different Canadian award ceremonies. And outside our borders, 31 projects won prizes in 13 international contests. The CMF exists to provide support for the production of compelling, cutting-edge, multi-platform content that will appeal to Canadians and to the world. It is there for you to leverage the funds for the creative, innovative work that you do. Of course, our investment in the CMF, in addition to over 500 million annually, annually put into Telefilm, the National Film Board, and two tax credit programs. So the industry is clearly stepping up to the plate. The federal government is investing more than ever before. And the result is that the talent of our Canadian artists and creators 
continues to be rewarded over and over again. Canadians are top selling musical talents around the world. People like Justin Bieber, Drake, Michael Bublé, Celine Dion, Marie Mai, and many others. Carly Rae Jepsen topped the 2012 Global Singles Chart with Call Me Baby. And I have listened to that song so many times in my house because my six-year-old loves it. And I know all the words, so. I'm a hip parliamentary secretary, I'm told, so. I don't know if you saw the Jimmy Fallon thing with, uh, with uh, Carly Rae Jepsen. That was a great one, too, so YouTube that. Uh, uh, Canadian actors are, are some of the most talented and successful uh, in the world. People like Ryan Goslin, Ellen Page, Seth Rogen, Ryan Reynolds, Michael Cera, and so many others. For the third consecutive year, Canadian film was nominated by the Oscars for Best Foreign Language Film, Rebel, War Witch, directed by Kim Nguyen. Canada's video gaming industry is a world leader employing over 15,000 Canadians from coast to coast to coast in high paying jobs. Canada is home to the Toronto International Film Festival, the largest film festival in the world, uh, and to some of the best production and post-production companies and facilities in the world. And when Canadians go to the movie theater, increasingly they are watching co-productions. Of course, our film and television industry, our, uh, our government recognizes that co-productions provide major benefits for Canada. I am positive that most of you are here, most of you here are well aware of these benefits. A treaty co-production is an arrangement between two producers in two countries to produce a film or television show by pooling resources. The treaty allows for the final production to be recognized as a domestic production in both countries. The benefits are obvious. In short, co-pros stimulate foreign investment, create new business opportunities, and generate employment by producing new projects that would not otherwise be made. In 2011, Canada's total volume of co-pros was $544 million, which is an increase of almost 20% from the previous year. Since 2006, co-production treaties provided $1.6 billion in foreign investment and $3 billion, over $3 billion to the Canadian economy. Feature films such as Barney's version, Resident Evil Redistribution, Retribution, excuse me. Sorry, I got redistribution on my mind because they're redistributing my writing, but anyway, it's a different story. Uh, so if you live in my writing, anyway, that's a, I won't get into that. Uh, Lawrence, anyways, and Mama and television productions like The Tudors and Babar have shown that co-productions work. They benefit producers, they benefit the creative community, and most importantly, they benefit the audience here and abroad who want to watch as much content and talent as possible. The co-production environment has some significant changes in recent years, and our government is responding to these changes. In 2010, we resumed negotiations with India, one of the Canada's key priority economic partners. As most of you know, in November of 2012, Prime Minister Stephen Harper participated in an official visit to India. The visit has been, has been seen as a highly successful to further expand trade between our two countries. Prime Minister Harper and Prime Minister Singh of India announced that both countries would endeavor to conclude the co-production treaty in 2013. But the policy framework for Canadian co-production is not without fault. Like all industries, it must modernize with changing technology. That's why in 2011, we introduced Canada's policy on audiovisual treaty co-productions. We conducted consultations on its implementation and heard from many Canadians and members of the industry, including many of you here today. I want to thank all of you who participated in those consultations, and today, I am pleased to announce the full implementation of Canada's policy on audiovisual treaty co-productions. What this will ultimately mean, simply put, is more film and television productions overall in Canada. We are making Canada a more attractive place to do business. And how are we doing this? Well, first, we've made it easier for Canada and our partners to get co-production projects off the ground by simplifying the administrative burden. 
We have provided fl a flexible approach for treaties which will increase productions overall. Second, as we learned through our consultations, not only were several of our treaties dated and in need of revision, but they, we needed new ones with new partners. For that reason, Minister Moore has already issued invitations to several countries to either start the negotiation or renegotiation process. Our government is taking action to strengthen the national economy and set the stage for positive economic growth. Canadian talent is incredible. The opportunities ahead are great, and our responsibility is clear. All told, with government and industry working together, we have come an incredibly long way. As recently as 60 years ago, this, of course, was not the case. For much of Canada's history, the creative economy was not understood, and nor was it supported. The results were, frankly, an embarrassment for Canada. In June 1951, the Massey Commission published one of the most significant reports in Canadian history on arts and culture. It outlined how Canada's culture was crumbling and slipping into foreign hands. It showed that there was indeed a crisis that had to be addressed. One of the findings of the Massey Commission report in 1951 was that only truly national publication in Canada was Reader's Digest, a publication that reached households across the country. Reader's Digest, at that time, of course, consisted entirely of American content. Sorry, Senator, not that there's anything wrong with American content, but... And also because of the American dominance in the textbook and publishing industry, American textbooks uh, filled Canadian classrooms and Canadian students knew more about the 4th of, of July than they did about July 1st. They knew more about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln than John A. Macdonald, Georgia Tancartier, and George Brown. In fact, the largest collection of Canadian publications in the world were at the Library of Congress in Washington and the New York Public Library and at Harvard University in Boston. The National Gallery of Canada in the immediate post-war years had a permanent staff of only four people. And at the same time, the Toledo, Mu Toledo Museum of Art in Ohio had 26 full-time staffers. In 1948, there were over 1,800 original works of fiction published in Great Britain, over 1,100 in the United States, and in Canada, there were 14. We've come an incredibly long way in supporting our culture. To all of you, leaders of our creative economy, I want to say thank you. I am proud of what we have accomplished. I call upon you today as creators, leaders, entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs to continue to be innovative. I say this because I'm coming to you today with a call to action. Indeed, we have had a fantastic opportunity ahead of us because in 2017, Canada will be celebrating our 150th anniversary. On the road to 2017, we think it's vital for Canadians to have opportunities to learn about our rich and diverse history. The sad fact is that, in Can that only four of Canada's 13 provinces and territories, only four, require a student to take a history class in order to graduate from high school. So last fall, the minister announced that we were creating the Canadian Museum of History. It will be housed in what's currently the Canadian Museum of Civilization, the largest museum in Canada. It has over three million items in its collection, 90% of which is in storage. This new museum will not only have a new name, but will have a new mandate. We want this national museum to truly reach across Canada to connect Canadian museums and historic places together. The new Canadian Museum of History will create partnerships with museums across Canada that have the same mandate, but at a local level. These local museums will have the opportunity to become official partners of this new national museum. This will allow for the telling of stories across Canada and the sharing of collections across Canada. Local museums that partner with this new museum will have access to over three million artifacts in the National Museum's holdings, and local museums will be able to work with the National Museum to share their collections with other museums across Canada. This will allow us to tell Canada's stories to all Canadians. And because so many of you are in the business of telling Canadian stories to Canadians, 
I would like to conclude my remarks today with a call to action. The 150th anniversary of Confederation and the road to 2017 will be a defining moment in Canadian history. Canadians needs, Canada needs excuse me, an institution that will research and explore our history, and we need people who are actively willing to help, our, help tell our stories and sell our achievements. In the months ahead, I ask that we all collectively put our creative minds together to find ways to help tell our Canadian story. Of course, government can play a role, but we need you to lead. I call on Canada's creative industry to take advantage of the upcoming anniversary to create wonderful works of art, and in so doing, carry us into the digital future. Let's use Canada's 150th anniversary as an opportunity for our creative economy. All of us understand that Canada's history is far from dead. It is all around us. It just needs to be, it just needs to be told, and it needs to be championed, and it needs to be celebrated. So in closing, let me just say, Thank you very much. Thank you for all that you have done to help improve our economy. One of the reasons why we are doing better than so many of the other economies around the world and the best in the G7 is because of your efforts. When you talk about the economic impact that your industry has on improving Canada, the economic impact that the jobs uh, have, it is because of your efforts. And when I look at uh, award ceremonies, you know, uh, artists, uh, it's, there's two things about, uh, about your industry. Uh, it's one of the things that makes us proud to be Canadians. When you go around the world and you see a Canadian production uh, on a TV or in a movie screen somewhere else, or you see a Canadian artist being somewhere uh, displayed in a museum around the world, you're proud as a Canadian. So it's your job to help us make, help the rest of the world understand why we're so proud to be Canadians, but it's also been your job to help create economic activity and growth, and you have done that very, very well and your government intends to continue to help you. I can say this, that uh, with Minister Moore at the helm, uh, he is by, uh, by far the absolute best Minister of Canadian Heritage this uh, country has ever had, and you have uh, responded extraordinarily well. So uh, have a great uh, conference, and thank you very much for allowing me to be here. And I'm sorry, at some point I'm gonna have to pop out to get to question period, but thank you very much for allowing me to be here in uh, place of the Minister. <laughs> That was awesome, Paul. Thank you. So, so that was that was really great. Um, it was one of those, you know, when I when Paul when I heard you starting to uh, pump out those uh, economic um, data points on the contribution of creative industries in Canada, it was one of those you had me at hello kind of moments um, because, you know. The, what, what, what is really in, incredible, and I think you know, a real testament to Minister Moore and yourself, is that while many people in the telecom sector, uh, the, where I used to come from, are continually tweeting and complaining about where's the digital economy strategy, you and the minister and Stephen Harper's government have actually contributed to it actually happening in reality. No big noise, no big fuzz, just incremental change that is benefiting everybody in this industry. And I think music to everybody's ears should be that this is a government that doesn't just talk about the economic benefit, which we think is critical, because if we can't prove that to you, then we don't have value to deliver to you. But you recognized it yourself, but you also, the shout out to the creators, to the talent, to the actors, to the directors, uh, to the technicians, to the people that construct the sites. That, you know, to us, that is, that is music because you understand what this, this industry is about. And, and so we can't be more incredibly grateful and we can't be more grateful to you for recognizing that, you know, if, if this industry is going to be successful collectively, we have to reach out to the world. We have to partner and we were talking this morning about all the successes we've seen so far by doing that under the initiatives you've helped us with. To, so to make it better, to give our actors, to give our writers, to give our producers the opportunity to work with the best in the world and often show the rest of the world that we're actually the best is a wonderful thing you just did and we're so pleased and I really want to thank you for that. So, 
Moving on, I know you have to run to question period. Anybody from Ottawa knows that no matter how much power you may wield in government, when the whip says you have to be in the house at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you better be there. They don't call them the whip for nothing. So um, I'm going to invite everybody to uh, sit back, enjoy your lunch, um, and then uh, Astrel's John Riley will be back shortly. John, um, when are you, you going to change? <laughs> uh, that's uh, anybody that saw John, and we, you know, like, who was here two years ago when John showed up in his white tux, bare feet, and 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 sang? Like, how many of you are here at lunch today because you're expecting something better from John? I don't know if you got it, John, but you got about. You know, 10 minutes and maybe a, a, little, uh, a little beef or chicken to uh, figure it out. Enjoy yourselves.